Hey everyone, this is Chris Mooney, and today we're going to talk about GDS3 challenge number two. I've made videos for challenge number one and the design test. If you haven't seen those yet, go check them out. If you have, then thanks for all the positive feedback. This video is going to be a little different. To save time, I'm going to skip over a lot of the technical details of the challenge. Uh, you can read those in the link in the description. I'm going to focus more on my journey through the challenge because, whew, let me tell you, it was a roller coaster. As you might recall, coming out of the last challenge, I was feeling pretty confident. Uh, I used the judge's comments to improve my designs, I made it into third place, and I was hoping to keep that upward momentum going. When I read the second challenge, I immediately felt like I was going to have a good shot at the top three this round. You know, flavorful design is something that I consider to be a strong suit of mine, uh, and top-down cards based on names, like, I felt like this challenge was right up my alley. Uh, after I submitted my cards, I actually felt even more confident than before. I mean, I knew for sure that they were going to hate tightrope. Uh, we'll talk about tightrope when we get to it, but I genuinely felt that the rest of my cards were like slam dunk, home run, A+. They all did something that was new and relatively simple, especially compared to my older cards. They had far fewer memory issues and like fiddliness problems. I didn't expect to win the challenge outright. I wasn't that confident, but I felt pretty good that I was going to be in like second or third place. For anyone who's read ahead, <laughs> things didn't exactly go the way that I thought, uh, which brings me to this week's main lesson, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> um, or rather, everything you think you know could be wrong. Just generally, assumptions are bad. That was the lesson this week. Assumptions are bad. Try to avoid them. My process for this challenge was pretty straightforward. Uh, we had a list of names to work with, so I just designed a bunch of those names. And then I picked the ones that I liked the best. Black was the biggest bottleneck for this challenge because none of the names like really fit with black naturally. So you kind of had to stretch. I picked my favorite black design, which would end up being sawed in half. And then I fit the rest of the cards around it so that, you know, I met all the requirements. I had all the colors. I had all the card types. Early on, I had to pick between two very compelling keywords, exalted and renowned. I really thought that both of these keywords were perfect fits in terms of flavor. A renown was pretty self-explanatory. It's literally a mechanic about gaining renown, which makes sense for a world full of performers. Exalted, I imagined, as the, you know, cast members of the circus all cooperating to put on a show. To me, the idea that you'd gather performers and they would all boost each other, but only one could be in the spotlight at a time seemed super resonant to me. I was so sure about both of these ideas that I was legitimately shocked to discover that no contestant picked either of them. Jay did mention Exalted in his blurb, but he didn't end up putting Exalted on any of his cards. I expected at least one other contestant to have done Renown, because I thought it was that obvious. The fact that not a single person picked Renown was like my first major surprise of this challenge, um, but it would be far, far from the last. Before we talk about my actual submission, I do want to go over just a few cards that didn't make the final list. Since this challenge was about top-down flavor, and we all had the same list of names to work with, it was pretty much expected that we'd get a certain amount of overlap. My acrobatics started out basically exactly as the card that Ari decided to submit. Uh, and Ari and I both landed on the same idea of a creature with equal stats being balanced, although he put it to much better use on his unicycle than on my tightrope. And finally, here are a few more top-down designs that I thought were pretty obvious, but they didn't make the cut for a variety of reasons. Most were cut to, to limited space. I could only make so many creatures, and a lot of the concepts that they gave us were creatures. Others were cut because their flavor would require a slightly different name to make work. Uh, and one was cut just because I didn't want to get into trouble with anyone's legal department. All right, let's get into the individual cards, starting with acrobatics. My acrobatics started out as just, let's give prowess until end of turn. As Aaron mentioned, shout out to Aaron Forsyth, director of R&D, and my personal savior of this challenge. The word prowess was a very flavorful word to tie into acrobatics. The question was, how do you make temporary prowess matter? And the answer was pretty clear to me. You just make it a cheap cantrip. That opens up the largest potential for you to cast a second spell on the same turn, while also giving it a nice bonus of chaining off itself. So I felt pretty good about this card, <laughs> and that feeling lasted about all of four seconds, because Eric was not pulling any punches today. I figured this card might underwhelm some, but I really wasn't expecting immediate removal. That's as harsh as it gets, really. This comment was a gut punch, but I really appreciate how informative it is. Not only does Eric put his comments in the context of his actual day-to-day -day role at R&D, but he also gives a very specific reason for it, which is very helpful, especially among a lot of the vague critiques. Personally, 
I had no idea that blue cantrips were something that needed tracking. Like, I literally just didn't think about it. Um, especially ones like acrobatics that actually required a creature in play to cast. So it was definitely a big learning moment for me. I just always sort of assumed that blue had a lot of cantrips because that's been true historically. But funnily enough, red actually has more unique cantrips in current standard than blue by, like, a lot. This whole thing sort of felt like I stayed up all night writing a book report and then when I got my paperback, I realized that I read the wrong book, and I now have a C. Melissa's comment about not wanting to see two of these was just icing on the pain cake, because I thought that casting two in the same turn would actually be a cool moment of discovery. Um, so now, not only did I read the wrong book, but the book I did read was actually the teacher's least favorite book of all time, and I've failed the assignment entirely. Luckily, Aaron and Mark enjoyed the design enough to give it a thumbs up, uh, but that was just sort of a moment's reprieve before the next dead drop. So I knew that when I submitted Traveling Circus that it was very weak, and I tried in vain to justify it a bit in my blurb by talking about splashing double colors, but the judges really weren't buying it. Another condemnation from Eric here means that we're now 0-2 on cards Eric would ever think about printing. I was disappointed by this fiddliness comment from Melissa because I specifically made the trigger on this card a May ability to prevent players from having to deal with missed triggers or being forced to move it around every single time they play to land. My calibration for what is and isn't too fiddly was still very clearly off base. Ultimately, I should have just bit the bullet and added some sort of end of the battlefield value, but again, it fell into the don't put too many words on it pitfall. It felt especially bad because a few weeks later, Dominaria spoilers were coming out, and Navigator's Compass was revealed, and it's a card that very similarly has low value, like it's not really worth a card. On further reflection, the compass is colorless, it gains you a few life, it triggers your historic card, so it clearly is a better card than Traveling Circus, or at least has more of a role to play, but no, that's still not saying much. All this ties into the comment made by Mark in my summary, talking about how I needed to put more work into finalizing my designs rather than leaving them in a kind of raw state. Up until this point, I had sort of assumed that the judges were looking more at concepts in these cards rather than execution, but with so many comments this week along the same vein across all the competitors, I think it became clear to everyone that we were expected to put more time into getting our cards into a playable state, or at very least we we're going to get called out if we failed to do so. It might seem obvious in hindsight, but remember that the time crunch on these challenges is a massive factor that doesn't come up often in the written articles. When you only have four days and very limited time with your playtesters, because you know, they've got stuff to do, getting everything to be properly balanced is often a very low priority compared to making sure the cards aren't broken in some other way. Ringmaster was probably my favorite playtest card. We had a lot of fun playing around with token producers, getting two or three creatures to enter the battlefield at the same time to really juice up that attack. So I was probably most disappointed by the reaction to this card than any other. Only Mark really seemed to get the flavor, or at least he was the only one who really mentioned liking the flavor. Uh, that was definitely on me. I should have added a line of flavor text to really sell the idea that the ringmaster introduces the acts as they show up, but Ethan Flacier appeared to me as the ghost of judging's past and sort of scared me off for putting flavor text on these cards, which, you know, in hindsight is kind of silly because it is a top-down challenge, but... You know, live and learn. Now, for the whole uncommon thing, uh, you know, please excuse me, I would like to defend my honor just a little bit here. Uh, I promise there's a lesson at the end. So, we were told that Big Toppy was a circus plane. Not just a set, a circus plane. So, it stood to reason that, in my mind, that an entire circus plane would have multiple circuses, right? I mean, like, look, in Pirate World, we had multiple captains. In Warlord World, we had multiple chiefs at lower rarities. Every ringleader we've ever had in Magic has been an uncommon. And in fact, one of those specifically works at a circus. You know, maybe you could argue that a ringleader isn't nearly as powerful as a ringmaster, but we get cards called Master at Common all the time. I don't mean to imply that I was treated unfairly here. I think it's a very reasonable expectation that the ringmaster at a circus be a rare, but this does further add to my main lesson here, which is that assumptions can be very dangerous. I assumed that everyone would imagine Big Tapia the same way I did, which is, you know, being full of many multiple circuses. Clearly I was mistaken. Betting your entire submission on an assumption like that could lead to disaster. So I'm lucky that only one of my cards leaned on that idea, but... <laughs> The ride's not over. 
Most of the judges liked Unicycle, so I won't go into the design too much. I think Melissa is right about the cost, and despite having numerous other haste-granting equipment with Equip 1, none of them also cost 1, and they usually don't also give you a evasion ability. At the same time, it's a Unicycle. How could it not cost 1 to cast and 1 to equip? Part of the flavor of this card for me was just trying to get as many 1s on there as possible, uh, and I think I did a good job with that. But balance does come before these aesthetic choices. Okay, so the second half of this judging looks like it's literally one of Mark Rosewater's Another Day of R&D Productivity Lost comics. I'm lucky that I had three judges in the room to back me up on this one, uh, but I do want to make a bit of a case for myself, mostly because this is probably my only chance I'll ever have to talk about unicycles in front of a couple hundred people, so you know, I gotta take what I can get. Hey everyone, this is Chris, and I'm calling you from several hours into the editing process. And in the time that it's taken me to edit this video, uh, the discourse around this whole unicycle thing uh, has blown up quite a bit. So the original bit that I recorded for this part of the video is a little outdated, so I thought I would just give you um, some final thoughts. The way that I see it is that unicycles are basically walls. In Magic, walls are creatures, because the way that we interact with them is the same way that we would interact with a creature. You know, we use them to block other creatures, we kill them with damage. Now, Mark Rosewater is well documented as not liking walls as creatures. He would prefer that they aren't on creature cards, because the flavor doesn't make any sense. Walls aren't actually creatures. But there's other people, including myself, that think walls are totally fine as creatures, because, you know, they might not be alive, but they are interacting with the other game elements the way that a creature would. So I think that this is basically the same divide that we have on the unicycle. Mark Rosewater sees a unicycle, and it is a vehicle. It is. So he wants to make it a vehicle card. Whereas myself and some other designers see a unicycle, and we want to make it interact with the rest of the game the way that we expect it to. And for us, that means as an equipment. So... This is just another disagreement. Personally, I love this kind of stuff. I love seeing all of these posts on Reddit and Twitter. So I'm glad, honestly, that we had this disagreement. And now that we've gone over it, let's get back to your regularly scheduled programming. I actually went to school with someone who rode a unicycle to get from class to class. And uh, let me tell you, that thing was fast, it was intimidating, and it was precarious, which is exactly what my unicycle card does. Maybe if your knowledge of a unicycle only comes from a circus, you might think that it's just sort of a, you know, silly trick. But as somebody who faced one down on a battlefield or, you know, in between classes on a college campus, which is pretty close, that thing is a force to be reckoned with. Again, this is another example of my assumptions being off base. I believe this flavorful disconnect happened mostly because Mark is thinking about unicycles as they're used in a circus, while I imagined that the circus stuff of Big Tapio was going to be repurposed for combat. This was a flavor challenge, so that meant that, like, these disconnects made a huge difference. Uh, and I think that the lack of clarity hurt a lot of the contestants, myself included. We were given free reign to define Big Tapia for ourselves, but we were only given 250 words to talk about our entire set vision plus all of our cards individually, and that meant that a lot of the connective tissue got left on the cutting room floor. You can kind of see it throughout all of the judgings, where clearly the designer and the judges were on different pages as to what was supposed to be represented then. Was I aware of Knife Thrower's Knife Thrower problem? Yes. Did I think about rewording it? Yes. So, why didn't I? Uh, um, I assumed that I would get dinged for using incorrect templating, uh, which is kind of dumb in hindsight. I actually spend a lot of time templating all of my cards, so when it turns out that not only Eli says I should have gone with a different wording, but also that Eric encourages me to not spend time templating, um, you know, it's kind of like that book report from earlier was actually supposed to be a research paper, and uh, now you've been in the wrong class all semester without realizing it. Another big assumption that led me astray here was the idea that my playtesters were going to be good indications of the judges. You know, my playtesting team was a huge help to me throughout these challenges. I couldn't have done it without them, but I should have been able to guess that their love of chaos wouldn't exactly be shared by everyone. We've had a lot of recent examples of cards with similar levels of variance, so I thought that putting it on a decent sized body would be fine. Ultimately, I think that the feel-bad of missing your throw was just too much for the judges. The other random cards that are on screen don't always result in such wild swings. You know, Knife Thrower goes from 
killing a creature on one side to doing literally nothing on the other. And that might just be too big of a delta. They also don't encourage you to put your creature into situations where you where they may or may not die based on the randomness you know big creatures like ital you don't really have to rely on the cards that they flip to keep them alive in combat whereas other cards like two-headed giant don't create such a massive swing of value the judges mostly liked juggling as do i so i just want to hit on a few quick points first of all the card cost six because i was less afraid of making it too weak than too strong uh, i think melissa is totally right that it could cost less Personally, I wanted to make it cost two blue-red, but that ran the risk of appearing like I didn't understand how strong the effect actually was. You know, is it better to appear too conservative or too naive? I'm not sure. I erred on the side of caution, uh, but I was called out anyway, so who knows. While I understand what Melissa is getting at with, you know, taking damage as an alternate downside, I mean, you're juggling. How can the downside of juggling not be discarding your hand? That's perfect flavor in my mind. You know, I mean, you could do something with the other version. You know, like, you know, you drop the balls and they hit you on the head and so you take damage, but you discard your hand from juggling. I, I just couldn't give that up. Lastly, I agree with Melissa over Mark that allowing for hand size altering shenanigans in formats like Commander is worth the extra rules text. I think that this is a card that people would love to sort of build around, or at very least, you know, put into a deck that already wants to have a huge hand size. Originally, the card did have a sort of much weirder triggered ability where you discarded your card if you discarded to hand size or something like that, but working inside the cleanup step just didn't seem worth it. It was easier to write it out. Plus, I think that the idea of having an infinite hand size means that you can juggle infinite balls is, is really fun, and it adds to the flavor. I, I would stand behind every decision that I made with this card. Sod in Half was received mostly positively, uh, except for Eric, which makes this the third card now that's just dead on arrival. So all I wanted to say is that, yes, I had the option of making two half-sized tokens, uh, but I chose against it for a few reasons. One, I just made a similar card in the last challenge, uh, so I wanted something that was a bit more creative. Two, the idea of getting one power-sized creature and one toughness-sized creature hadn't ever been done before. And, and I thought it sold the joke a little better, of it being, you know, a top half and a bottom half, rather than simply just being two equal halves. You know, when you saw someone in half, you get, you know, a torso and a legs, not like two, you know, equal parts of them. And three... I just think it's a little more fun, you know, a little more crazy, a little more zany, like you would expect of a circus. I imagined the art for this card would depict sort of two eldritch horrors that grew out of the top and bottom halves of the volunteer slash victim. Originally, this card was slated for the flavor text, Any Volunteers? Which, you know, it, it wasn't really necessary, but it was short enough to fit, and it helped sell the target player sacrifices a creature part of the card. Again, the ghost of Ethan either led me astray or saved me, depending on how you feel about that flavor text. As for tightrope, it's, it's yet another mess. Uh, you know, I latched onto the idea of balancing creatures, and I just wouldn't let it die for something less inspired, but I should have because it was really hard to make work. You know, flavorfully, I felt like a tightrope would give you sort of a bridge-like effect that restricted what could get into combat, but I also wanted to provide players with a built-in way of escaping the lock so it didn't just become a stalemate if all your creatures were unbalanced. I... I made the ability pre-combat so it wouldn't result in like big onboard blowouts or having to do a ton of math. You know, you had to decide what you were pumping before you attack. But even then, it, it would still lead to a ton of confusion. Uh, the Vigilance is on there because when we playtested it, it felt kind of weird that the card didn't actually give you a benefit for having it. You know, and originally it said that, you know, creatures with equal power and toughness had Vigilance, but we realized that only your creatures with equal power and toughness were going to get into combat anyway, so we could just give all your creatures Vigilance. Part of that was that we wanted the card to naturally benefit you if you actually built around it, if you actually had a deck full of creatures with equal power and toughness. The card currently does that because it allows you to attack with those creatures without having to pay, but I think we ended up with just a card that was not as much of a build around as it should have been. Ultimately, this card is another complicated failure. But I do think the idea of rewarding balanced creatures is something that could result in a fun card, but it takes a lot of extra work and it, it's definitely not this one. So overall, the judges gave me a lot of good advice, and their summaries are all pretty straightforward. We receive all the judgings together in one big packet, and we were encouraged to read through all the comments each week. And this week... I found the most insightful gems in what the judges said to the other contestants. For instance, uh, Melissa provided a really valuable piece of advice when she talked about uh, rate, the idea of rate, or how the cost 
of an effect is central to the design. I think a lot of contestants, myself included, put monocos at a low priority because we figure that they could only really be sorted out through hours and hours of playtesting and we just simply didn't have that time. But Melissa helps to illustrate here why the relative cost of an effect is an important part of the design and it's not something that can just always be easily changed through testing. If the only reason your card is exciting is because it gives you a powerful effect for cheap, then making that card more expensive doesn't just make it weaker, it actually just dismantles the entire design. So I thought that was a really helpful piece of advice. Um, another example is Eric and Aaron's focus on cards that will actually get played. Eric, especially this week, tagged a lot of designs as cards he would just remove immediately, which, again, is a great way of bluntly providing feedback while also putting it in the context of his job. Part of Eric's job is literally removing troublesome cards from card files in this manner. So his comments do a great job of connecting our challenge to the reality of magic design. Um, yeah, who knows, maybe this week he was pulling cards from a real magic set, so that's why he had it on his mind. Similarly, uh, Aaron talked a lot about cards as webcomics, um, which means cards that are cool to read online, you know, in, during spoiler season, but will never actually make your deck. That said, skimming through the rest of the judgings also shows you just how divided they were this time around. You know, Mark Rosewater gave us a warning the day before we got these judgings. He told us, watch out, they're super divided this week. As it turns out, they were the most split on me. I'm sure this is something that the folks at R&D have to deal with on a daily basis, but they can have conversations about their disagreements. And uh, remember that us contestants, we never really had any channel to hear from the judges other than these bi-weekly emails, which meant that, you know, you got your judgings and you had four days to try and decipher what the judges wanted out of you and deliver on it, or, you know, the next thing you could hear could be game over. So it was incredibly stressful when the judges were sending you mixed signals and you weren't sure how to proceed. So to recap, I came into the challenge feeling pretty confident and left feeling just battered. <laughs> not only did I not make it to the top three, um, I was dead center in fourth out of seven, but two of the judges, and it seemed pretty clear which two judges, put me in the bottom two. That was incredibly harrowing. You know, I was lucky that Aaron Forsyth was here to save me. Thank you very much. But as the guest judge, he wasn't going to be around moving forward. You know, don't get me wrong. It's nice to have the head designer and the director of R&D, you know, like your stuff. But at the end of the day, Great Designer Search is a game show. And two of the three permanent judges were ready to send me home this week. So that was terrifying. So all of this combined with the general volatility of the judges this round and the continuing advice that I got to stay practical, my strategy for the next week seemed pretty clear. It was play it safe. You know, that didn't mean stop being creative, but it meant that my plan was to cater to the two practically minded judges that currently had me on their chopping blocks. You know, I knew that I might disappoint Mark if I submitted something safe, but I figured that I had built up enough goodwill with him that I could potentially survive one round of his dissatisfaction if it meant earning points back with the other two judges. And, and I was really worried about that because I didn't want to keep going and relying on the guest judge and Mark Rosewater to save me if the other two judges really didn't like me. So it was really important that I proved that I could design in the way that they were looking for. As long as my idea still played well and was decently creative, you know, I'd be able to stabilize myself in the contest and then I could recalibrate and pull ahead. So whew, that was a tough round to take. Definitely a big wake up call that all of the assumptions that I made were, were pretty far off base. So thank you all for watching. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, it's awesome to see and hear from you in the comment section and on Twitter. Uh, let me know if you have any more suggestions or comments or questions. Tune in next week to see how my strategy pays off. I hope to see you all then. Thanks for watching.